I was uh, very disappointed in the Royal Commission. It gave some really good recommendations, but it ultimately seemed to say that we have to begin by accepting the legitimacy of the Canadian state. And this is terribly troubling to me not because I want to say I want to throw out everything and the state isn't legitimate and I, you know, let's go and do something crazy. Because the state is legitimate when confronted with other similar entities. It's no worse or no better than the United States or any other state. But for ourselves, we'll never be able to come to grips with this issue, in my opinion, deeply held, the issue of, of a just, fair, reasonable relationship, an understanding of a relationship with indigenous peoples. If we begin with the assumption that somehow they were so much less than we are that we could just say, we're here, it's ours. I don't see that as a basis for creating a relationship. Now, I have an interesting side point on this, which I'm going to just mention for a second. But I understand that in Quebec, there is a line of thinking, which I don't know very much about, but the student had told me about, in which they say the original position on confederation made sense and that the way in which the governments and the courts have reinterpreted that relationship is what's been the subordinating factor in, in creating the existence of that relationship today. So... If that's so, then the illegitimacy that I'm talking about extends all over because it's not about whether the relationship between Quebec and Canada is fair or colonial. It's about, regardless of who we are, how we're situated in relationship to the indigenous fact. That's what's the important thing. Not that the other doesn't need to be worked out, but as... And I, and I really think that uh, André Lejoie is someone who's really struggling to try to figure out how to, how to work on that. I think so. I mean, I don't know whether I want her to hear me say that, so I'm not sure about that, but, um, because I'm putting words in her mouth. But I think that's what, what it is. Okay. So I got here, and as I say, I learned up with all of these brilliant scholars who are here because all I was all I was been able to do, like scholars of my generation in terms of our activism, is to point out what's wrong. Just keep on showing what's wrong. And it ended up with I got a book contract for this book on being here to stay with uh, the University of Toronto Press quite a long time ago. And I said that the book I was going to write was going to be about summarizing everything that I'd said in the last 15 or 20 years, not going much further than that. And so the first five chapters of the book do that. And I got to the end, and this book was written in a way that I feel like I was possessed. Rather, it possessed me rather than I controlled this, this book. 
which is unusual because I generally feel that I'm way far ahead of what I'm writing when I'm when I'm writing. And I got to kind of the end of the fifth chapter. And it, this is absolutely true for the for what's written down here, or it's the fourth chapter. It's a, it's the fourth chapter. It's the fifth part, but it's the fourth chapter. And I said, "There's something wrong with what I've been doing for the last twenty years." So you can imagine that. I'm I'm almost the halfway through a text that I figure I'm going to be done with, and I said, "Whoa." And here's what I said. Basically, I said, I've won the argument. You have got no argument against my argument that we have no legitimacy in the face of indigenous fact of being here before we came. There's no argument. They have sovereignty and jurisdiction. And that is the central problem. The self-determination argument puts settlers in a no-win position. And I had never really considered that. I've always thought it's a good thing to put us in a no-win position. We need to have the humility to understand where we are in this relationship. But that's the truth-telling aspect. And now, 20 years later, there's a whole bunch of people out there who have understand that. So if you who are listening to this or watching it still believe that we have the right to be here, no questions asked, I ask you to read the first four chapters of my book because I'll convince you that we have no legitimate right to be here. But I'm really writing the rest of this book for those who are convinced of this argument. And where do we go from here? What do we do? What is the way forward for people like ourselves? And that's what the rest of the, the book is about. And it requires a revisioning of our history in ways that people of my generation just don't like, I guess, find offensive. I would say find offensive. Now, if I'm speaking to a general Canadian public that's knowledgeable of the American popular music traditions. This is the Bob Dylan cynicism of the period. There's something wrong, and I'm going to point it out. He does that all the time. There's something wrong, and I'm going to point it out. And it leaves you like it leaves Mr. Jones in that early song of his, not knowing what to do. And there's a lot of people who feel that's great. That's the best we can do. Unsettle. Unsettle the settler. Unsettle, unsettle, unsettle. Create that. I'm not the kind of person. I want... My anthropology tells me that it's not about agonism, it's about consensus building. It's about trying to bring people together. And so I started to ask, what can I do? And luckily, I was working with a student at that time who was doing a dissertation on Treaty 4, which is one of the treaties in the prairies in Canada. And so I had a chance to look at what happened at that time. And it's amazing how little any of us have looked at these materials because it's hard to find any literature of the kind that I'm talking about. So the commissioner who negotiated that treaty, um, Treaty 4, actually had a transcription of what took place. 
people who've read the transcription have read it from this. And again, I have to blame anthropology for this. From an assumption that because you have an indigenous culture and a Western culture, the Western culture couldn't possibly understand the indigenous culture, so this guy didn't understand what was going on in the story. How could he? I mean, he's in 1870-something, he didn't trained in anthropology or anything, filled with Christian this, that, and the other thing, can't possibly have understood what was going on. Anthropology has, builds its justification on incommensurability, I think, too much. It doesn't need to, but it wants to say, look at how different these people are. Look at how different these people are. And we do it well, and we need to do it because there are a lot of people who think people aren't different, or difference means they're inferior. We need, But we don't do the other side, which is people are also able to talk to each other. What's the anthropology that we do that says, hey, despite all of this other stuff, somehow people are able to talk to each other and not live in silos. So I looked at what this commissioner said. And he started to talk about treating people with kindness. He started to talk about building relations, not taking things over. And then I looked at another negotiation, and they're talking about similar kinds of things. There's no talk about the we're going to take over, we're going to govern you, you're going to go to reserves, you're going to do this. That. It's not that it didn't happen. It did happen. But I believe that it happened because those people weren't listened to. And there was another group of people who were very much of a different spirit who said these people need to be disciplined into becoming like us. So I started to work on that stuff. What is it? Is it possible that these people could have come to an agreement, notwithstanding how different their cultures were? And what, and what are the terms of the agreement? And I found that the way in which the indigenous people explain what, the, what happened in the treaty lines up so well with what the commissioners said it would be. So either they're completely lying and there's reasons to suspect that they're not, and I, have, I can talk about that if I need to, but, or that at some basic level they understood each other and through that we were given permission to stay here on those terms. So that would be a way of moving to the, not to the resolution, but to another step. All we need to do is fulfill the terms of those agreements. And not the written things, you know, so many plows or this, that, or the other, but the basic understandings that are there. Like, whatever happens on these lands, they will be beneficial to you. There's a wonderful clause in which the indigenous parties are saying, we're very worried that we're, our food supply is going to give out. We're very worried that if we start doing agriculture, we're not going to succeed. Will you have our back if that's a problem? And the commissioner says at first, no, because the queen will do that anyway, but they don't like that. And he says, well, no, because you guys are just going to take advantage of it. I mean, this is how honest they were with each other. You know, because you guys are just going to take advantage of it, and we don't want that. And they say, no, we're not going to do that. So regardless of what's written down in the treaty, he says, he says, should something, should a calamity happen to your people? Not something that happens in everyday life, but a calamity. We will not let you die like dogs. And yet the way in which we've implemented all of these arrangements is letting them, if not die like dogs, live like dogs. So wouldn't it just be a place to start to say, no matter what we do, the first thing is we're going to make sure to live up to that pledge, that, that we will treat these people like human beings 
working together to resolve issues and certainly not produce crap like Site C Dam or, uh, or uh, tar sands that actually destroy their lives because we, we promised we weren't going to treat, treat people that way. So that's kind of, after all of this, I got, I've gotten to as kind of a first step. And the anthropology in there is that as an anthropologist, I feel that I can have the confidence to challenge anthropologists to say, you can get beyond cultural difference to figure out that people can work together. And then you've got to figure out where the cultural differences create real problems, not not your made up things, but a real problem. Here's a real problem. In our culture, we start off with boundaries and we imagine that only people who are the same belong in those boundaries. So, you know, look at what, look what's, you know, you can think of so many places where this is happening, but you know, if you're not one of us, you belong in another place. And we need to build a boundary around that all X belong together or all Y belong together. Y, you can go live somewhere else. We've, we've built the world like that. That's a very basic way in which we organize things. It's not the only way we think about it. It's very basic about the way we organize things. Supposing that confronts a world, which it does with indigenous people, which say, no, no, no. You build that container. So, that, so we're building a container for everything that's alike. So all Cree belong in the container Cree, and so on, right? Or, you know, all Canadians belong in the container Canadian. All Quebecois belong in the container Quebecois and we draw boundaries around it. And if you're not one of those, you belong somewhere else or whatever. Supposing you say, no, we're, we build the containers to fit the people we want to live with. So I want to live with people who are different from me. I don't want to live with people who are the same as me. In fact, one of my indigenous colleagues said one of the most bizarre things about us is that we don't want to live with people who are different from ourselves. She says, isn't it a hell of a lot more interesting to live with people who are different from you? So that's the way. So animals are part of it because you want to be with, in relation to everything, things that are different from you. Th doesn't have to be species-wise. Doesn't have to be anywhere. And so you're building networks of, of relations. So that's a cultural way that's very different from our way, which is... That belongs in that box. That belongs in that box. We've got to figure out how to work together on that level. That's a cultural issue of major proportion. So I'm not denying that there are cultural issues. But what I'm saying is you can't just say, it's cultural difference, can't do anything about it. Oh my God, they're incommensurable. You have to say nothing's incommensurable. You just have to work to figure out how to get somewhere. And even if you don't share it together, you can communicate with each other. So you have on the prairies, people who spoke Assiniboine, living in the same community with people who spoke Cree, and those two languages are mutually unintelligible. And yet they learned each other's language to live together because they wanted to live together. Why can't we start doing that? That is what I think the anthropology can do. So that in a nutshell is what I think is my contribution to anthropology. Is that the, this notion of reconciliation you refer to? That's the. Uh... Well, the reconciliation is the attempt on our part to work out how to approach things that are different when we want to just reject things that are different. We have to. We have to figure out how to be open on things like that. You know, I think um, when uh, when when we discovered the new world, to use that language, huh? and I'm using it purposely. When we discovered the new world, we had a choice. The people in the new world and the new world itself weren't in the Bible. 
Right? We know that for a fact. We weren't in the Bible. We had a choice. The choice we made was to say, ah, God put them there so we could convert them. But we had another choice. And if we had made the other choice, I think it would be a hell of a lot more healthy. Maybe God didn't tell us everything in the Bible. Maybe there are some things we can learn and don't know. And we still don't have that openness. And the same thing happened at the founding of, of modern anthropology, which I date to 1859, which is very different from other people, but, uh, but um, it was uh, the... Uh, oh, God, I don't know why I got into this. Oh, okay. Um, so we all know, I think, we all know that geological time replaced biblical time in about 1837. Do you know is that? The, when, when the geologists, uh, you know, after they did all the stratigraphy stuff, and the oh. geologists and a guy named Lyle came out with a book called Principles of Geology, in which he said, yes, the Earth is a million years old, not 4,000, right? What people don't know is that he rescued the human race from geological time. So we were still living in biblical time in, in 1835. This caused all kinds of crises. You can read it. It's beautiful stuff to read as historians of Egypt and China are complaining that you've got to do something about this because clearly these civilizations are older, but the, but the powers that be do not relent until 1859, there's a, an archeological dig using techniques that are used today in a cave in Britain in which they find remains of animals that were clearly there before the flood with human artifacts. And the same guy, Lyle, he's now president of the Raw Society, I think, announces the end of biblical time for the human race at a meeting in Edinburgh. And at that moment, all of a sudden, human beings are in, also in geological time. Well, this guy, Tom Troutman, who's a brilliant historian and anthropologist who wrote on Dravidian, that's why I know him, but he, um, he, he was writing on Morgan's systems of consanguinity. He wrote a paper on that, on that topic. And he says, at that moment, the bottom dropped out of ethnological time. We created ethnological time. And that led to Morgan being able to say the first stage of human development was, was 60,000 years, which then led to the kind of second form of colonialism where it was assumed that these people were so primitive that they'd never catch up, right? But what we could have done at that moment rather than reinforce the stadial theory which clearly no longer made sense since one period was, right? One period was now like this. It used to be in biblical time, the periods were kind of like this. Now the first period is is way longer. We could have said, you know, there's something wrong with the stadial theory because clearly people were doing something in these 100,000 years. Maybe it wasn't technology, but clearly they were doing something. But instead we said, no, they were just so primitive they didn't do anything. So that's our arrogance. <laughs>